folks, I'm Tom Vassell. Welcome to Crowd Surfing. This is a show where we talk about Kickstarter and the different board game projects that are on Kickstarter. So that's it. We're going to start with the news. Here we go. Okay, well, first of all, from Big Kid Games, we had Montana Deluxe. Now, Z actually has played Montana before. It came, uh, I think we got from White Goblin Games. This is a nicer version of it. There's no stretch goals. It's an interesting project. There's no stretch goals. They're just going to be adding upgrades along the way, which sounds like they're secret stretch goals. Either way, I think that's a fine way to do things. I don't think they should be tied to certain numbers. Um, but um, I heard this was a very good game, so check it out. WordForge is bringing back D-Day Dice. This is a big deal. D-Day Dice is one of the first Kickstarter projects to really get a lot of uh, fame for how much stuff they added, which I think, in, in retrospect, was a really bad idea. They added so much stuff that I don't think the company made any money on it, and that company, Valley Games, eventually went out of business. Um, but it's been re-picked up now by Word Forge. Uh, they also did a game called Devil's Run 666. And again, there's a ton of content. <laughs> so this is a cooperative... Uh, dice game where you're landing on the beaches of Normandy type thing. Uh, I hope that this one succeeds. I hope it does well. From a new company, we have Master Suites, the card game. Uh, this is a 15 to 30 minute game. Of course, it has to do with desserts and things. I like that. But how you're placing things out in rows and columns, it's like a card placement style game, looks intriguing. Gearworks, the steampunk strategy card game. This is from Peacekeeper. Their first game was Flag Dash, which kind of came out of nowhere. It was a capture to flag game, which I thought did a very good job. So I'm interested in seeing how this one goes. Um, it's a card placement area control. And when you put these cards in the end, they're gears. You'll turn it towards your color. The concept sounds pretty cool. So excited about that. Stumped, the deck building game. Now, this game is kind of intriguing to me. It's from a first time uh, publisher. It is, uh, has these buildable wooden trees. And I actually have a game around here somewhere. I think it's Arbos or what have you. Oh, here it is right here. It, yeah, Arbos, Afael. It has this, it, you're putting this tree together. It's like a dexterity game. The trees in this project looked exactly like this one. Um, the, but they're different colors. They look great. But it's also a deck building game. You're trying to be the first person to put 10 pieces on your tree. Now, if the tree is just there for looks, that's good, I guess, but, you know, it does add a lot to the cost of the game. But still, I like it. It's a fascinating, cool theme. Then we have Ravine. This is a follow-up to Space Team. Now, this one's really intriguing because Space Team and Ravine are both funding extremely well. Both I've never heard of. I've never heard of anyone talk about them in board gaming circles. This seemed to be more mainstream-style games. Uh, for the uh, Space Team, there was all these you know, big newspapers and things that are talking about how great this is. Ravine is about you landing in a plane crash and then surviving. How are you going to survive working together to survive from this plane crash? Um, from Matthew Sisson, it sounds interesting and cool. And again, it's one of those ones that's like, wow, I, I haven't heard of this one at all. Detzilla, uh, this is from Capital Gang. Uh, the, there's a fun artwork. This is another one of their games set in the Banana Republic. It's a, a cooperative game where you're fighting against a monster, Detzilla, or his friend, Inflationosaurus. It, like, teaches economic principles, but it's a funny fight-a-monster game, simultaneous cooperative-style game. I like simultaneous cooperative games. The theme, I... It could be heavy-handed, I suppose. Like, you should not go into debt. You know, I, I don't know. But I'm hoping the game is good. Then White Wizard. Now, White Wizard, of course, is known for a few games as time goes by. Uh, as Epic and space, uh, uh, space Realms and Hero Realms. But this one is a completely different game. It's called Sorcerer. So in Sorcerer, you're going to be fighting against someone else. It's in that genre of Sorcerer versus Sorcerer, which is kind of tired and old. But... In this game, each person is going to pick a character deck, a lineage deck, and a domain deck. You shuffle those, and that's your deck. So it's like that shuffle thing that you've seen in Smash Up. So that means in the initial set, there's 64 combinations of sorcerers, which I find is very fascinating to play against each other. It's also hard to, to, to uh, play test that sort of thing. The artwork's a little dark for me in this one, um, but I am curious to see what it's going to look like at the end. Mountaineers. I saw this one at Essen. This is a 3D board game. They're saying it's the world's, possibly the world's tallest commercial board game. What's right? It's like this high. It's this mountain, and you're climbing up the mountain on the sides of it. Um, when I saw it at Essen, 
it looked interesting. It's made up these boards uh, that this company has made boards to like display games on, things like that. Uh, it didn't look like it was the best of quality there, but again, it was probably just a prototype that I was looking at. Uh, so I, I do like the 3D aspect of this one. Hopefully it's easy to take up and take down because, you know, the world's tallest board game is great until you have to store it in the world's tallest bookcase. War Room. Now this is a fascinating one. This is from Larry Harris. Larry Harris, you may not know his name, but he is the designer of Access and Allies. Most people know that game. This looks like another version of Axis and Allies. It has these cool 12-sided custom dice, a 42-inch diameter map. That is huge, folks. Um, it's not going to fit on most boards, but it's all about World War II. It has plastic tokens rather than like little figures like uh, Axis and Allies does. And some people are calling this Larry Harris's opus. Um, okay, I, I hope I hope this is this is good and fantastic. Um, it's curious that he picked like the same theater and he's like making a new game in the same theater, but again, it doesn't look like Axis and Allies at all. All right, my pick of the week this week is Box Throne. Now, Box Throne, it almost was my pick of the week because it's expensive, but these shelves look fantastic. If I could afford it, I, I love these IKEA shelves, but I'd replace them with the Box Throne shelves because essentially you're putting one game per shelf. And so you're stacking them there and you can even have like the shelves connect from bookcase to bookcase. The idea is fascinating. I really, really like how it looks. Um, I like the fact that each game is there. I mean, I have these games vertically. I'd rather have them horizontally, honestly. But when you put them horizontally, then they they're harder to pull out. Games will fall. Maybe they'll crush each other's boxes. But with this, they stay there. So like I said, it's pricey, but they look amazing. Lumberjacks is making a game called Living Planet. This is probably going to do well based on its designer, Christopher Bollinger, who's done things like Dungeon Twister and Archipelago. Um, this is a resource management game for two to four players where you're on a planet and you're doing different things, but the planet's alive and it's going to smack you down. All right. I like the theme of that. Um, Lay Waste is coming out with a game called Human Era. The Lay Waste has known their first game was Dragoon. This is a time traveling game. And usually I'm like, I'm out, because time traveling is really hard to do in a board game. I don't think it matters much in this game because it's a 4 to 10 player social deduction style game. So with that being said, it's going to be in a kind of a different thing and has cyborgs. Some people are cyborgs at the table. It's also really pink. Um, so I remember uh, there was a game that asking for troubles was very orange. Well, this one's very pink. Now, this game has amazing artwork, and I would want to get it based on that alone. Museum this is a two to four player game where you're building a museum. It's from Holy Grail Games. You might have seen a review of the Rising Five. The artwork in Rising Five by Vincent Dutrait was amazing. The artwork in Museum is also amazing. Again, it has actual 180 real artifacts that Mr. Dutrait has drawn. I don't know anything about the game. I heard the game is good, but just it looks phenomenal. Uh, and then finally, Samurai Vassal. I believe Mark Street on our own channel did a, a, a paid preview for this one. Uh, this one, of course, attracts me because it has the word Vassal in it, even though it's a different spelling. But a simultaneous action card game. Where you're trying to get 12 trust points, bluffing each other. So, and I also like the samurai theme. Anyway, that's what I saw in the news. Let's hear from some experts. Hey, Board Gamers, BJ from Board Game Gumbo here, back with more Kickstarter lineup. That's right. I'm bringing you projects that won't break your budget, but throw in a little something extra. One of my favorite all-time games is Baseball Highlights 2045, designed by Mike Fitzgerald. It's a great deck builder where players compete to draft teams of futuristic players and then try to win a best of seven showdown. Hey, what's the downside? To some, baseball's not the greatest theme. I, I don't agree. I love baseball and I love the theme, but how about a game that has a similar feel to it but with an interesting twist on the mechanics and a unique theme. Enter Bushido from Gray Fox Games. It's designed by Pedro Mendoza, and it's out on Kickstarter right now. Gray Fox is the company that's already brought out the excellent Champions of Midgard series with all of its expansion glory, so they have a history of good releases. But let's talk about Bushido. Bushido players play as students of the martial arts. They're going to start with the training phase where basically you, you learn... In other words, draft cards that have skills, techniques, schools, and weapons. Then you enter the dojo and compete against the other trainees. First one to knock the other warrior down to zero health wins the duel. 
The base game comes with enough cards to play with two players, but students can buy additional base games to play with multiple people. If you want to check out the rules for yourself, Gray Fox included a copy of the rules right there on the Kickstarter page. What's in the box? Well, as you can see, it's still early in the campaign and we don't know about all the stretch goals yet. But so far, here's what you get if you support the project. You get play mats for two players. You get all the necessary tokens. You get the weapon cards. You get the technique cards. You get those 22 special dice and all the unlock stretch goals. Let's check out the pledge levels that they have. I showed you the $25 one. As you can see, you get the base, base game uh, plus all the unlock stretch goals and enough for two people. But check out the $37 one, which is Gray Fox putting a little line up here on the page. For the $37, you get the main game and you get the expansion, Rising Rage, for two players with 10 new dice thrown in with new weapon and technique cards. Now, all of the pledges that you see on the page come with the stretch goals. Look, I wish they had shown us more of the stretch goals. We don't know what they are at the time of this recording, but we do know what the first one is. It is Laser Etched Dice. So that's Bushido out on Kickstarter from Gray Fox Games. What do you think of this game? Let us know in the comments below. And until next time, les les bon temps roulés. Oh, hey, what's funding? Just enough time to take a quick look at a game that's seeking crowdfunding right now. And today we're taking a look at Epic Monster Tea Party. So here we're taking a look at Epic Monster Tea Party. This is a game where players are going to be monsters reaching into a labyrinth, pulling out heroes that they will either put in their teacup to hopefully drink into their stomach or squish them for their abilities. On a player's turn, they will simply reach into the labyrinth bag, pull out a hero and decide what to do. You'll have a fighter who will allow you to drink the contents of your cup, the cleric who allows you to squish her and redraw, a rogue allowing you to steal from another player's cup, the wizard allowing you to spill the contents of any cup back into the bag. The ranger, who you can't squish, but if you ever swallow him in your stomach, you must puke up two other characters. The bard here, who is a stretch goal, allows you to swap the contents of two cups. And the king and queen, who are worth a whopping seven points, but are wild if you squish them and can recreate the abilities of any other character. So on a turn, you know, you may have these in your cup and you pull a rogue, a fighter from the bag and you decide to squish him making him out of the game and putting these in your stomach. The game will go round and round until all the heroes have been pulled from plucked from the labyrinth. Players will drink the final contents of their cup if they have anything left. You'll check the point values of what you have in your stomach bag and whoever has the most points is the winner. So let's look at Epic Monster Tea Party. Now what you saw in the overview obviously was a print and play copy that I did myself and as such does not represent the final game. From what I've seen, the final game will have wooden meeples for the heroes instead of those discs and be full color artwork and be of nice production quality. The first thing I realized when I heard about this game was the name sounded familiar and I couldn't figure out why until I looked at the designer and it was Rob Couch. For those of you who don't know, Rob Couch is one of the hosts of the Building the Game podcast that I happen to be a huge fan of and realized I had heard about this game in its many inceptions for quite a while. With that said, I also really enjoyed this game. Now, this game definitely is aimed at younger children, but I found even with adults, it can be fun if everyone just plays it lighthearted. The theme itself is actually kind of dark. You're these monsters and you're squishing heroes and you're drinking them, but it's presented in this light, fun way. For children, the game offers actually a decent amount of strategic thinking and elements of push your luck and even some take that that they can then use to build upon skills for other games or other things in life in general. For adults, the game is fun. It's possibly something maybe to end a night with. If you have children, this is definitely a game I would advise taking a look at. The artwork is cute. It's fun. It's simple to learn and it plays quick. The game says about 20 minutes in my experience it's a little bit less than that. I hope you've enjoyed this look at Epic Tea Party, uh, Epic Monster Tea Party rather. And if it's something that piques your interest, go take a look at their crowdfunding page. And I look forward to seeing you folks next time. When's the best time to run a Kickstarter? And there's a lot of people who will tell you, there's people who've tracked it and saw you know, that this time a Kickstarter will work well this time. For some companies, they just, the Kickstarter, they launch it when they're ready, right? We got everything ready to go. Some people launch it when they have the idea. That's a bad time to launch. You know, they're not ready. 
Um, other people are going to look for very specific times. Some people will launch during a convention because then they can go, maybe they're at that convention, they're demoing to people. And when people play, they're like, this is interesting. They say, well, you can go back it right now or some right after the convention. So you build up the hype at the convention and then do it. Some do it, you know, at different times of the year so that the they can get the game delivered around Christmas time. There's no secret that Christmas time is the biggest shopping time for board games. And so some people can say, I'll buy this and then I'll have it to give out as a present. Now, this is problematic if the game is delayed, which seems to be inevitable with most games. Um, and then you, you won't have it at Christmas time. I'm, I know that for me specifically, I backed a, a non-gaming project, I think, two years ago to get at Christmas time and still haven't got, haven't got that project yet. Um, so I don't think I'm going to have it for 2017 Christmas either. But be that as it may... When is a good time to do it? Now, we run our Kickstarter in January for the Dice Tower. And some people could say, well, it's a bad time to do it because everyone spent their money for Christmas time. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's there's never, you know, we picked that time because it's a good time for us and it's a new year. It's a fresh start. Maybe some people got money for Christmas and they can support the show. Or people, you know, if, if, if it goes long enough, the Kickstarter, if people do their tax returns early, they might have a refund to work with. Who knows? Um, but there's not as many, you know, there's certain times of the year where you don't see it running it near the beginning of a month when people are getting their paychecks. Uh, many people get paid at the beginning of a month. And so maybe that's a good time to run it. My question for you though, in this one, and I like to see this in the comments here is when, when is your most likely to buy it? Is it in the Christmas season when you're shopping? Is it during a convention or like after you've seen it live somewhere? Does the time frame not matter to you at all? Uh, do you, maybe the winter when there's not much else to do and so you're just surfing the internet more and that's when you tend to buy, you know, to back Kickstarter projects? Or does the timing mean nothing and you're more concerned about, hey, this is the next Simon project, this is the next uh, Ninja Division project and I want to back them now? So what is a good time and when's a bad time to launch? You know, like, oh, well, during the holidays is the worst time. I'm too busy spending money on other things. In the middle of the summer when we're on vacation, worst time because I might miss it. So tell me in the comments, when's the best time you think to back a Kickstarter, and when would be the worst time to launch one? Again, I, like I said, I know there's data points already out there where people have tracked it. I think it is different depending on what kind of campaign it is. A campaign can be successful no matter what type time of year it's running, and a, cam a campaign can fail no matter what time of year. But I find this sort of thing fascinating. Let me know in the comments. This is Jamie Stegmeyer of Stonemeyer Games, and today I'm going to talk about partnership. Uh, Stonemeyer Games would not exist today were it not for my business partner, Alan Stone. I was designing Viticulture back in 2011 and sharing it with friends, and I realized uh, that, uh, that it was hard to, as much as I was enjoying designing a game on my own and sharing it with people and, and figuring it out and making it better, um, I... I wanted someone constant there, someone that I could always call upon to play test, someone I could always email at midnight to brainstorm something random about the game with. Um, and uh, one of the, the guys I played with, Alan Stone, I was playing with his, his wife and him, and uh, he mentioned that he really enjoyed uh, the design process. It was new to him and he wanted to be a part of it. And that really opened up something to me, that someone else would want to be there and be a part of the process just as much as, as I wanted to be there. Um, I hear a lot of creators who come to me or, or talk to other creators who are struggling because they're going at it alone. And I think that's largely because game design is mostly a solitary process, um, at least in terms of the actual design and prototyping element of the process. Um, but to have someone else there who can compliment you, uh, who can not only urge you on like Alan does, or Alan calls me out on stuff where, where I get too enthusiastic about something that I shouldn't be excited about, but also, I have weaknesses like everyone else. You have weaknesses. Um, that might be in terms of your skill set. It might be in terms of your funding. It might be in terms of some area of your business expertise that you don't have that someone else might have. Um, maybe you love running, uh, maybe you love designing a game and you love uh, working with spreadsheets, but you don't like interacting with customers all that much. That's okay. If you would uh, identify that within yourself, that's great, and then you can you can either learn to do that, or you can find a partner who's really, really good at it. The one last thing I want to mention, if you do decide to, to get a partnership, um, is to have very clear expectations about your role in the company, in the partnership, and, and your partner's role in the partnership, or multiple partners if you have more than one. 
And from my experience, I would recommend um, looking at those expectations over time and not having a firm agreement in place from the very beginning. I would recommend at some point having a very firm contractual agreement, especially if money is on the line, but don't start off that way because what you might find is that the sweat equity, the time that you and your other partners are putting into it, at the very beginning when you're all really excited about it and it's all, all this potential, that might be very different than three months down the road, six months down the road, a year, Later, when you're in the midst of a busy Kickstarter, you might find that you are doing a lot more or a lot less than you thought you would, and your equity in the company, your ownership, should reflect that sweat equity, that time that you're actually putting into it. So make sure that agreement is flexible. Don't lock yourself in to uh, an ownership of the company that doesn't reflect your sweat equity, the time that you're putting into it. Um, yeah, those are my overarching thoughts. If you want to read more, I have an entry about partnership on my Kickstarter lessons blog. Thanks. That's it for another crowd surfing episode, folks. I'll see you again in two weeks. This one was delayed a day. Normally they come out Wednesdays. This one came out Thursday. That is mostly because we're preparing for our cruise, so we're a little bit behind schedule. Either way, I'll see you guys. Lots of stuff to back. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Crowd Surfing.